everyone. I'm Joan Liashenko from the Center for Bioethics and the School of Nursing. And on behalf of the Center for Bioethics, I welcome all of you to the Center Seminar Series. We believe today's talk will be informative and provocative, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, attend. Before introducing our speaker, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Department of Pedi the School of Medicine, the Department of Pediatrics, and in particular, the Division of Endocrinology, and the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Women's Health. We are wired to two other sites, the University of Minnesota Duluth. Is that Duluth I see? We, thank you for waving your hand. Um, also the West Bank, the Riverside campus, and it isn't clear that anyone is, is there, but we will <laughs> periodically look and check for them. If you want to apply for CME or CEU credit, please sign up in the back. And um, I want to announce our next seminar series because it actually relates very much to this one. On May 2nd, philosopher Hilde Lindemann will be coming and talking on why families matter. And it directly relates to today's topic because she was a member of the Seattle Ethics Working Group on Growth Attenuation that was convened by Dr. Dikama and his colleagues and the disability rights community in Washington. So I think that she will um, have interesting things to say about why families matter. It is a pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Douglas Dikama, a physician and bioethicist. Dr. Dikama is professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He holds adjunct appointments in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities and the Department of Internal Medicine in the School of Medicine and the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health. He is an attending physician in the Emergency Department of Seattle Children's Hospital and serves as Director of Education for the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital. He has been a member of Seattle Children's Hospital Ethics Committee since 1991 and has served as an ethics consultant since 1993. He has been a chairperson of the Institutional Review Board since 2000. He is past chair of the Committee on Bioethics of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is a member of the Ethics Committee on the American Board of Pediatrics. Over the years, he has had numerous special national and local responsibilities. Among Dr. Dikama's more than 118 publications are referee journal or are 70 referee journal articles and 12 book chapters. And I think I missed a few because he said some were submitted, but I know they've already been in print because I read them. <laughs> he is also an editor of Clinical Ethics in Pediatrics, a case-based textbook. I highly recommend this book. I use it in my classes. Um, it's really um, a very good textbook. And lest you think that Dr. Dikama is all work and no play, I will tell you he enjoys running. A leftover from college days when he was an NCAA champion in cross country. He is also a published photographer, some of which we will have the pleasure of seeing today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doug Dikama. Thanks, Joan. That was very kind. And good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be in Minneapolis, and I appreciate the weather you all um, ordered up. <laughs> I was a little nervous about coming last week, um, but now we're having nice uh, Seattle-like weather. <laughs> At least uh, the weather's like this in Seattle right now. Um, this is actually my backyard, um, uh, metaphorically speaking, and um, my playground. And um, one of the things I have certainly learned living in the Northwest is that uh, to really understand a place, you have to get into it. You can't just sort of look at pictures and understand it. You have to get into the landscape. Rearing up behind the big white mountain there is Mount Baker, which is one of our 10,000 plus foot volcanoes. Um, and, uh, but to really get to know those mountains, you have to get into them. And, and the same thing applies to ethical issues, that you know, to really think 
carefully about them, you have to understand them. And that means getting into the details of cases and trying to understand the facts and, and uh, get your boots on the ground. Uh, Ashley's case, <coughs> which I'm going to talk about today, is certainly an example of that. There was an awful lot written about her case, uh, a significant um, uh, number of the papers and articles that were written about Ashley were um, not accurate. Uh, in many cases, the arguments that, that uh, people uh, put forward to either support or uh, disagree with what we had done were based on flawed facts. And uh, it's important um, to recognize that to really do a good job with the ethics of any topic, you have to understand actually what was going on. So part of what I'm going to do today is take us through some of that. Um, so I am going to sort of revisit the Ashley case and walk you through the Ashley case as sort of we walked through it in Seattle. Uh, and, and along the way, talk about the ethics of growth attenuation in particular. And to a certain degree, I'll also address the question of um, hysterectomy uh, with, with Ashley. Um, so I have no financial relationships to disclose here, I, and uh, I do not um, plan to discuss anything other than high-dose estrogen, which is technically an uh, off-label use of the drug. So let me tell you a little bit about Ashley. When we first encountered Ashley, she was a six-and-a-half-year-old girl. She had actually been in the children's system for many years. She'd been followed by our developmental specialist, by our endocrinologist. She had a general pediatrician in town. And at six and a half, she, uh, her primary diagnosis was profound developmental disability. Um, a static encephalopathy was the sort of clinical term, which is sort of a way of saying we don't really understand why her brain is the way it is, but um, it is, and it doesn't look like it's going to change. Um, she was, in the estimation of the developmental specialists, operating at the, about the level of a three-month-old. Uh, based on their best knowledge and um, uh, review of Ashley, they estimated that she would remain at that point. To give you some idea of what she was like functionally, she uh, really was very limited in terms of her motor ability. She could not roll over on her own. She couldn't sit up on her own couldn't feed herself or do really any caretaking activities by herself, um, and really was dependent on her parents for everything, including just rolling her over to keep her from getting decubitus ulcers. So she was a very dependent little girl. Um, she uh, did spend much of her day in a wheelchair. She needed to be strapped into that chair in order to, to remain upright. She was attending um, school um, and was in a classroom. Uh, sometimes on a bed and sometimes in her wheelchair. And what had brought them to sort of the attention of the endocrinologist was that at six and a half, she had started to develop pubic hair and some breast budding. Uh, and um, so it looked like she was entering puberty um, several years early. Uh, but the parents um, were actually not interested in arresting that puberty. Their question really was that based on her height at the time, which was about the 75th percentile, and the height of both of her parents, her likely ultimate height, and along with it, the weight that goes with that, were, were likely to be above average. Um, and <clears throat> they were interested in limiting that for a number of reasons, uh, which they shared with um, our committee. And, and um, almost all of those reasons had to do with trying to optimize their care for Ashley. The parents were very, very committed to making sure that her life was just like the life of all their other children, that she remained in their home, that she could experience the same sorts of things the rest of the family was experiencing. And that meant going on trips and going to the park and those sorts of things. And um, they were not naive. They were, they were realistic parents who recognized that as she got bigger and this got more difficult, that no matter how committed they were, this would change. That at a certain point, you just stop going to the park. And at a certain point, you um, don't do airplane trips and then car trips and so on, because there's just it's, it's too difficult to do the transfers and, and so on. And, so, um, and, and they didn't want that. They, they wanted to be able to continue to be able to transfer her and have her participate in activities. Um, and dad felt 
you know, he said, I, I can currently lift her, and I would like that to remain the case. Obviously, if she becomes adult size as I get older, that's not going to happen anymore. And then we will be reliant on uh, mechanical lifts and so on. So we'd like to see if there's some way we can limit that. And at the same time, they were also interested in dealing with is issues of menstruation, the possibility of pregnancy, uh, and other issues which I'll, I'll talk about, as well as um, a request to remove her breast buds so that she would not uh, develop uh, fully mature uh, breasts. So their primary question was whether there was a way to limit growth for their child. Now this was not <clears throat> sort of a, you know, pull it out of a hat sort of idea. The, the reality is that there is a history of doing this to young women, and that history dates back to the 50s and 60s and 70s when, in fact, growth attenuation was done uh, in many cases by general pediatricians and family medicine docs to otherwise uh, healthy young women whose parents would bring them into the doctor's office, and, and there's a very important historical context here because they were the tallest girl in the class and the parents were concerned about the, what a disaster this was for their daughter's marital prospects and dating prospects and everything else. Now things have obviously changed a little bit. <laughs> the stigma attached to being a tall girl is, is not nearly what it was in the 50s and 60s. Obviously um, being a tall girl now gives you some major advantages in terms of athletics as well as whether you ever are um, going to become a CEO or a college president. Um, and, and so, um, but height was different in the 50s and 60s. And so the reality is that thousands of young women were treated with growth attenuation. One of the interesting things I learned through this process was that one of the women sitting on our ethics committee, who's probably the tallest member of the ethics committee, had actually undergone growth attenuation therapy as a teenager because her parents had this concern. So we actually had somebody on our committee who had experience with high dose estrogen therapy as a teenager for different reasons than Ashley, but um, nonetheless she had gone through this. So first of all, we knew this therapy was available. So you talk to an endocrinologist and they say, yes, you know, this used to be fairly common. And the reality is there are still endocrinologists that get this request from parents and there are still endocrinologists that will do it for some young women uh, who feel that they're going to be taller than they want to be. Um, but there's also a medical literature on this. Now, it's not like much of our medical literature, the greatest um, scientific uh, you know, sort of, sort of methodology, but, but nonetheless, we have large case series that amount to, you know, over a thousand cases being described of young adolescent women who underwent high dose estrogen therapy. And so what we do know, at least from that literature, is that the side effect rate is very low, particularly the adverse, the, the serious adverse event rate. Um, some of these women get a little nauseated, some of them, um, uh, you know, develop other fairly minor symptoms, and I think out of the 1,000 plus cases that were described in the literature, there was probably only one instance of, of a deep venous thrombosis that ended up self-resolving without any um, serious sequelae. So it, it proved to be a relatively safe treatment. Now this can be delivered in a number of ways, but one of the ways we now have available is a transdermal skin patch. And in Ashley's case, the endocrinologist projected that he had projected that her adult height would be 5'4". The reality is her genetic potential was considerably higher than that. Her, she had a very tall mom and a very tall dad, and um, I don't know their exact heights, but I'm just guessing that probably her genetic potential was more like 5'9 or 5'10". Um, and uh, but, but for a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, many developmentally delayed kids don't uh, often achieve their genetic potential and the fact that she was already in uh, precocious puberty and that in itself would shorten her eventual height. His estimation was 5'4". Um, and he felt he could get her to 4'6 with high dose estrogen therapy starting at six and a half years of age. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the other thing they talked about was that the primary side effect of high dose estrogen therapy is heavy menstrual bleeding. And so the parents had brought this interest in a hysterectomy forward, and one of the questions people commonly ask is, well, why at six and a half? Can't you wait to do that? Um, and the answer to that is, yes, you can. The parents' answer to that is, we know you can, but uh, we also know this is, this is how we want to handle uh, 
the issues related to um, having a uterus in our daughter. And if we're going to do a hysterectomy, we would far prefer to do it before she gets high-dose estrogen therapy so that we can knock off the primary side effect of high-dose estrogen therapy. And their argument actually makes good sense. If you're going to do a hysterectomy anyway at some point, the time to do it is before you give somebody high doses of estrogen. Um, now, there is a risk of deep venous thrombosis with high-dose estrogen. It's, um, I don't think we really know how, whether it's greater than birth control pills, and if so, how much greater. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little greater than in somebody uh, who's non-ambulatory than, than in somebody who is, so there is some risk of that with Ashley. Um, yeah, but otherwise, the risks are pretty small. Now, the parents also had these two other requests. And their request for a hysterectomy was not radically different than the, the reasons many parents of kids with severe developmental disabilities give when they bring this request forward. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The um, breast bud removal was a very unusual request. It's one I had never heard before. It's one most of the people on our committee had never heard or even thought about before. The parents had, <coughs> again, a very... Um, sort of patient and family-centric reason for this. The, the, the history on the mom's side was of having um, uh, sort of a um, uh, not entirely positive relationship with their breasts. Let's just put it that way. Um, most of the women in the family had large breasts. They experienced uh, pain, uh, particularly during their menstrual periods. Um, they, uh, many of them had fibrocystic disease, which meant an increase in the number of mammograms and and so on and so on and 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 the mom the mom voiced that she wasn't sure why Ashley should have to go through all of that when there were really two primary reasons for having fully developed breasts one is to nurse a baby and the other is for sexual pleasure and uh, and so on and and uh, you know she said my daughter's not going to be in the position to really meaningfully take, participate in a sexual relationship or breastfeed a baby. And, and so why should she have to sort of experience the sorts of discomfort that many of my relatives have from having large breasts? So that's where that request came from. That wasn't just sort of a, we don't want her to look like an adult. That really wasn't part of the equation, even though that's the way many people have um, uh, sort of framed that, that uh, part of the issue. So let me just talk briefly about the hysterectomy issue. Um, <clears throat> the truth, the, what the data shows is, is, about, is that about half of parents with kids like Ashley actually think about a hysterectomy. Now, most of them end up not doing it. They end up controlling menstruation and menstrual pain and so on through other means, sometimes not entirely successfully. But at least 50% of them think about this as one possible solution. So this is not. Um, something that is bizarre. I mean, th this is something that many of these parents wrestle with and think about and ask their doctors about. Um, and it's almost always coupled uh, with having a child who, in the estimation of the parents, will never be capable of marrying or meaningfully parenting. And, and you know, sort of the way I frame this for people is that you're, you're talking about a group of kids here that if your prognosis is correct, the only way they would ever get pregnant is through an abusive, manipulative relationship, not through a consensual um, experience with, with, with somebody they had picked. And parents have lots of concerns, and Ashley's parents expressed all of these. There's a fear of pregnancy. We know that the rate of um, abuse by caretakers among these kids is much higher than it should be. Uh, and it can be very difficult to control. It's almost impossible not to leave these kids at some point with a caregiver so that parents can get respite. And if they're put in a uh, facility, obviously the, the rate goes up even higher. Um, and that obviously has significant impacts on a child who can't understand the experience of pregnancy, who now either has to undergo an abortion or uh, go through childbirth without really understanding what's going on. Um, and it, it creates obligations for the parents of that person uh, who now have a baby that they have to do something with. Um, they, these parents have concerns about the efficacy of other forms of birth control. Um, some of them have difficulty getting their children <laughs> to take medications. 
uh, and they worry about um, that, among other things. Uh, con control of menstrual flow, behavioral symptoms of distress related to menstruation, both of these um, were felt to be likely in Ashley's case, who had, she had demonstrated sort of dysphoric reactions to seeing her blood and to having blood drawn and other things, and the parents were concerned about her reaction once menstrual periods would start. The family also had a history of menstrual pain, many of the women in the family, and so again, you know, one of, mom's, one of Ashley's mom's points was why should my daughter have to suffer through menstrual cramps um, if we have a way of preventing that and if there's no sort of really benefit to her keeping her uterus. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing she pointed out was, you know, she, it's, she can't communicate with us very effectively, so we know when she's in distress, but we have no idea why much of the time. And, and, and so we won't even know necessarily that her distress is coming from menstrual cramps, and it makes it difficult to treat it in that particular situation. So why not eliminate that variable was sort of the argument. Uh, there, there are issues of menstrual hygiene, and I mentioned the fear of sexual abuse. And, and um, these parents are not naive, and Ashley's parents certainly weren't. They're not naive enough to think that if you take the uterus out, you'll prevent sexual abuse. That's not what, what's uh, being accomplished here. And I will also tell you that in their minds, that was not the reason for breast bud removal. They knew um, doggone well that just removing her breast buds and, you know, wouldn't keep her from getting um, taken advantage of at some point. Um, boys, the parents of boys have these same concerns, by the way. So a lot of people said, well, you know, Ashley, her situation only applies to girls. But we get these requests from parents of boys as well. And um, it's often boys who um, have severe developmental disabilities and um, are maybe hypersexualized in their behavior. And their parents are really worried that they can't fully control that boy's behavior all the time and they don't want that boy impregnating somebody and can we do something about that. So again, these are not uncommon requests of parents of some of these kids. So this is where the ethics consultant comes in. <laughs> um, I was the lucky guy. Um, the, the first call came from Ashley's general pediatrician who, um, who said, um, we need to get an ethics consult and I just want to warn you you're going to hear what I have to say and you're going to think this is absolutely bizarre. And she said that was my first response. I said there's no way we'll consider any of these things. And she said the reality is that I've come around and I actually think Ashley's parents are making a request that's reasonable. So the general pediatrician had actually already gone through a process starting from no way to uh, coming to see their side of things. And um, uh, sort of gave me that warning as a prelude. And this was a case that after being presented to me, it was very clear, should not be handled by a single person. So I um, uh, recommended that we do this as a full committee so that we could take advantage of um, all of the uh, multiple disciplinary and background sorts of expertise that our committee members have, everybody from pastoral care to administration to nursing to developmental specialists and, uh, and get all those people in a room to talk about this. Men and women, um, uh, people who had undergone growth attenuation and people who hadn't. Um, a fairly good variety of people. And you know, the question for us really was primarily, is it ethically appropriate to proceed with the parents' three requests? So the full committee was convened. Um, par the parents and Ashley came to the first part of the meeting and I think it was important for Ashley to be there. Uh, we needed to see her. We needed to, uh, it, it, it allowed us to sort of balance what the parents were saying about her with actually seeing her in the room and, and seeing that they weren't making any of this up, that you know what they were describing about their daughter actually was what we were seeing. Um, it also, you know, obviously makes Ashley a real person. This sort of, be, this sort of moves from a theoretical case to, th it's about this little girl sitting in the room here. Um, and that can be important. Um, Ashley's dad presented their reasons for wanting all three of these procedures and then we asked them to leave and the committee deliberated for um, a couple of hours uh, following that and, um, you know, did the ethics thing, right? So um, the first step for us was to identify the question and, you know, there were really, um, there was really one primary question, and that was whether this was in Ashley's best interest. And, and I will say that, that, that sort of this, uh, this was framed uh, 
by the committee in that way, that, that this is about Ashley's best interest. We recognize that some of this stuff may make the parent's job a little easier, but that is not a consideration we will give any weight to. The only thing that will carry weight with us is whether this benefits Ashley in an important way and whether that benefit justifies the potential burdens and what she may have to lose here. Uh, the other thing we did, and, and this was on my recommendation, um, because my experience has been that cases like this are very difficult for people to get a handle on because they're very complicated. And, and running a discussion about something like the Ashley case gets out of control very quickly because the first comment is about growth attenuation and then somebody wants to talk about breast bud removal and then you're on to hysterectomy and then you're back to growth attenuation and then and it's all over the map so the way we structured this discussion was from the beginning we recognized that these three procedures did not need to go together in other words we are not the ones that invented the Ashley treatment and I quite frankly don't like people referring to this as the Ashley treatment. These were three separate procedures that uh, were done because somebody felt that they were in the best interest of the child. And the reality is they don't have to go together. Now they are interconnected, right? I mean, the, the, the biggest side effect of growth attenuation treatment, high dose estrogen, is heavy menstrual bleeding. And you can eliminate that by doing a hysterectomy beforehand. Uh, the other thing is that if you're going to do some kind of a procedure on Ashley's breasts, the best time to do it is when she has breast buds, not fully developed breasts. It's a much easier procedure surgically. There's much less morbidity than if you're doing a full mastectomy. And the reality is that as soon as you give her high-dose estrogen, she's going to develop mature female breasts. And so, again, that's a procedure you want to do before, if you're going to do it at all. And then, and, and it, the parents had thought all this through, the, these were very sort of um, smart parents. They didn't want Ashley to undergo more than one surgical procedure, so they wanted the hysterectomy and the breast buds done with the same anesthesia to limit the number of times she'd be exposed to anesthesia. So there are all these timing issues and there are these interrelationships. You can reduce the risk of surgery for one procedure by doing it at the same time you do the other and so on. But the committee still felt like you know, we can say yes to growth attenuation therapy and no to the other two things. We could say yes to growth attenuation therapy, the hysterectomy, and not the breast bud removal. So let's talk about them all independently and see where we come out. So we started <clears throat> with growth attenuation. We moved on to hysterectomy, and we ended with the breast bud removal. And I will tell you that the easiest discussion surrounded hysterectomy, not because it's an easy issue, but because there's a literature on that topic. <laughs> so we had something to draw on. The other two were completely novel from an ethics perspective. Nobody had ever discussed these in the ethics literature. And um, so we had to sort of um, do our own analysis using, um, you know, sort of principles and rights and so on. Um, now, there were two subsidiary questions, you know, about who gets to make the final decision and um, whether there are limits to the kind of decision that we would tolerate. But ultimately, even the answer to those questions comes down to what's in Ashley's best interest. Now, one thing I will say is that if you're going to approach this from sort of a principal's perspective, um, this is not where you're at. It, this is not a case where you're talking about the right of autonomy and the right of beneficence. Um, there is no autonomy here. Um, we're talking about parents making a request. Autonomy is about self-rule. It's when you make the request for yourself. And we respect autonomy because you're telling us what you want. Um, what the developmental specialists are telling us is that Ashley will never have any kind of decision-making autonomy. And, and so there really is no discussion of autonomy here. The only discussion is, and this was part of the committee meeting, and this was the question posed to the developmental experts, will she ever, at any point in her life, potentially achieve the ability to make decisions like this for herself? Because if the answer to that question is yes, then we don't say yes to any of this stuff. Um, but the answer we got from the, exper the medical experts was no, this is not going to change significantly. She will never sort of achieve that level of decision-making capacity or anywhere near it. So, you know, from a principal perspective, you're really talking about the principle of beneficence. What's the good thing for Ashley? What benefits her? What um, prevents harms to her? And what promotes her good, ultimately? 
And medicine is a form of this. We all know that. That's part of the reason we take this seriously. But so is parenting. And I will say that despite the fact that Ashley's parents were often colored in sort of negative ways by the media and the blogs and, and so on, um, that they were very caring individuals. And in the, in the words of um, my colleague, Norm Faust, he said, it's unbelievable the way people are villainizing these parents because he said, Ashley is the kind of baby that there are many parents who would decide not to resuscitate her at birth and nobody would, would blink an eye about that. And yet not only did they do that, but they're fully committed to her and they want these things because they think it's going to make their life, her life better and people are villainizing them for that. And he actually has a point about that. Um, that that's an important one to think about. Um, now the problem with beneficent sort of based analyses is they are value dependent. I mean, <laughs> people are going to disagree. And, and that was very clear in this case after the fact. People are going to disagree about how burdens and benefits stack up. Anytime you're talking about a situation where there are some benefits to a patient and some burdens, people will disagree about how those things should be weighed against each other. And that is just the reality of um, sort of what we do in ethics and particularly when you're talking about uh, the principle of beneficence. So in sum, what we did as a committee was we considered each of these requests separately. We focused on the benefits and the risks to Ashley. We felt that if it was reasonable to agree that the benefits justified the risks, then Ashley's parents should be able to make this sort of a decision as long as there was a physician who would provide the services. And Everybody on that committee recognized that um, these three issues raised some major concerns, um, ethical concerns. Those were discussed uh, in depth, and um, ultimately the committee um, felt that Ashley would actually probably benefit from all three of these um, in, in a way that justified the potential harms that would arise. But it was not without a very thorough discussion of a lot of uh, very important issues. And I will also say that um, I'm not aware of a single person on that committee that did not come into this discussion as a skeptic. In other words, if it, it's fair to say that the bias of the, the strong bias of the committee when people walked into the room was to say no to all three of these, um, or at least two of them. You know, maybe the hysterectomy was something people would consider, but the other two, they weren't so sure. And when we left the room, there wasn't anybody. Everybody had, still had some qualms about it, but there wasn't anybody who was willing to say, um, I really don't think the parents should be allowed to, um, to proceed. So a couple words about the discussion on hysterectomy. Um, <clears throat> birth control and control of menstruation can clearly benefit a patient. Um, and m many adult women know this because they seek it for themselves. And, and, and so it, it's undeniable that that can have some value. Um, retaining the ability to bear a child may not always be a benefit if you're the kind of person who will never experience a benefit from bearing a child, have that capability to do so. Um, and it seems to me that the burden of proof still has to lie with those who seek to inv involuntarily sterilize another individual. In other words, there needs to be a high level of proof with this sort of thing because what you're taking away is something um, that at least historically we know if you do it in the wrong person, it can be regrettable. Um, and that was certainly the case, you know, 50 years ago in the United States when we were sterilizing individuals who were not significantly developmentally delayed and who did actually retain the capacity to parent and to marry, uh, who lost that ability because somebody somewhere had decided they should um, be sterilized. We all agree that individuals who have decision-making capacity or will achieve that should be able to choose a sterilizing procedures. And for the most part, well, uh, almost entirely, they should not have one involuntarily done on them. Um, those who do not have the capacity, um, generally we should protect their future choice and interests if there's any chance they will, retain, they will re gain that capacity in the future. Um, they should have the same range of options available to them as those with capacity. And I would argue that includes the option of having a hysterectomy done if it's deemed to be in their best interest, um, in part because there are very few benefits to them from having a uterus. Um, 
what are the relevant areas of capacity to sort of the question of sterilization? And I think there are three of them. I think um, the ability to understand the therapy or procedure under consideration, its risk benefits and alternatives are one of those. Um, the capacity to bear responsibility for the consequences of those decisions is another one. And the capacity to raise a child safely or be in a relationship with somebody who can is another one. My feeling is that if you're dealing with somebody who at some point in their life may be able to marry somebody else willingly and have that person assist in raising a child, that's a person who should not be sterilized, um, even, if they have a, you know, even if they have some degree of developmental disability. I, for example, don't think kids with trisomy 21 should have hysterectomies done. Um, or that level of disability. I mean, some of those kids actually do end up in relationships and, um, and sometimes with people who um, are capable of raising a child with them. Um, so there's a fairly high level of sort of what we require for hysterectomy. And, and in my mind, I think it requires profound and permanent developmental disability and agreement of that from multiple specialists. Um, the procedure should be relatively urgently necessary. There should be clear and convincing evidence that the procedure is in the best interest of the individual. And the same benefits can't be obtained from less intrusive or reversible methods. Now, all of these things, this was sort of the method we followed in the committee with regard to the hysterectomy. And the feeling was that the hysterectomy was appropriate. In other words, that it passed all of these sorts of tests. Um, there are clearly alternatives. Um, and there are lots of them. Uh, but one of the things you need to remember is that every one of these alternatives comes associated with its own set of potential harms and side effects. Um, and in the case of the easiest one here, which is some kind of um, hormonal treatment, say oral contraceptives, um, you're talking about a young girl, Ashley here, who would need to be on these for as long as 40 years in order to prevent pregnancy. She's non-ambulatory, which greatly increases her risk of developing the significant side effect of oral contraceptives, which is deep venous thrombosis and even pulmonary embolus. Um, that is not an insubstantial risk. And that risk it may actually be greater than the one-time risk of having um, a hysterectomy done. Uh, and, and, and so that this, it's not, this is not as simple as saying, why would you do a surgical procedure when there are alternatives? You really do have to sort of consider that every one of these alternatives has its own set of risks um, associated with it as well. Um, and some of those risks, the, the other piece of this is that when you're dealing with a young girl like Ashley, many of these things are much more problematic than they would be in a child with normal cognition for a number of reasons. Um, if you pick an IUD, for example, or endometrial ablation, you may be able to place an IUD in a 17-year-old with normal cognition without anesthesia. You will not be able to do that with Ashley without anesthesia. And it's not a one-time thing. The IUD needs to be replaced periodically every time she needs anesthesia to do that. Likewise, she will need anesthesia for pelvic exams and cervical exams if she has a uterus to make sure that she's getting cervical cancer screening. She will probably um, very possibly need anesthesia to have mammograms done. Um, all of those things will be associated with increased risks um, if you don't sort of do the sorts of things the parents want. So th this is all to say basically that the very simplistic answer that many people had to this case, which was why do something when you can do nothing, is not an option because you never do nothing. If you don't do what the parents are requesting, you have to follow these other routes, and these other routes are not without their own sets of potential harms and problems. Um, just a word about males. Um, w these same requests sort of apply to males. I think it's harder to justify sterilization in males, um, in part because they can't get pregnant, uh, and, and so that potential harm to a, a severely, uh, profoundly developmentally delayed male uh, is, is different than it is for a female. Um, but parents do worry about their potential to impregnate others, and, and uh, I think it requires a very high level of proof to do that. Um, but I certainly understand uh, why those parents are requesting it when they do, and we have certainly had requests from parents for that. 
Um, the bottom line about Ashley's case is I, I really think this was about making one little girl's life and one family's experience a little bit better. Um, and not about setting a precedent or creating a policy. And our committee was very clear about that. The last part of our note um, of that committee meeting said, this does not create a precedent within this institution. In other words, what we recognized was there were some very, very specific factors that applied to Ashley that probably would not apply, at least with regard to the breast bud removal, to the vast majority of other kids. And we didn't want say our endocrinology department or our gynecologist to suddenly think that you know we were approving this for anybody who requested it and so we made it we were very clear about the fact that we felt these cases or similar requests should probably come back to the ethics committee to really help people think through these um, processes and I don't have the kind of ethics committee that's looking for business so that wasn't sort of a self-serving thing um, <laughs> We also felt that in cases where reasonable people disagree about what's in a child's best interest, the parents probably ought to be um, allowed to make that decision. Now, as I mentioned before, there was no significant disagreement on our particular committee, which probably included about 15 to 20 people uh, in this particular case. Um, uh, but nonetheless, th that was voice, that you know, even if some people sort of feel that it would be reasonable to disagree, then um, the parents still should be able to decide. So we recommended allowing the parents to proceed. We did recommend um, that the parents get a court order for the hysterectomy. Washington State has um, a lack of clarity in their law surrounding hysterectomies. There is no legislated um, law. It's, uh, there is a case that people rely on, and the details of that case did not relate to Ashley very closely. And, and so um, most of the thoughtful legal scholars I've talked to who have looked at Washington State law have either said, we don't think the case law applies to Ashley, or they've said it's unclear enough that it should be adjudicated. Um, and, but, but because of that lack of clarity, and we had a, one of our hospital counsel in the room at that committee meeting, um, we did recommend that the family get a court order um, to deal with that issue. Um, and as a general rule for any request for a hysterectomy of a minor, and all of those requests come from parents of profoundly developmentally delayed kids. Um, we require a court order. Um, and then we also re suggested that the hospital develop a process for independent review of any future requests like this. So the committee was very, very careful in sort of the way they worded their final um, uh, report. So the final outcome was that Ashley did indeed undergo a surgical procedure where her uterus was removed and her breast buds were removed. Her ovaries were preserved so that she would retain uh, normal hormonal um, production. High dose estrogen treatment was, she underwent that for two years. Uh, it resulted in probably a two to six inch reduction in her ultimate height. Um, Dr. Gunther's original projections um, were probably not accurate. He, he actually thought it would be potentially be closer to 14 inches. In reality, it was probably more like two to six. Um, and then um, after some time, uh, Dan Gunther, who was the endocrinologist, approached me about writing the, uh, this up for publication. Um, he he um, really felt Ashley's and, and her family had benefited from this and, and wanted to put something in the literature. Uh, that sort of put this on the radar screen of other endocrinologists. My, my interest was just that this was a really interesting ethical issue. Um, and so I ended up sort of authoring the ethics part of the paper. He wrote the medical part of the paper, and it was published in Archives of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine um, with a very boring title that we thought nobody would notice. And um, you know, I th we thought it would be the typical medical journal that gets read by three people, all of whom are related to the authors. <laughs> and, and it really wasn't, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in our paper, we, the, the, what we recommended were a set of criterion that were pretty conservative. I mean, what we basically said was this shouldn't even be considered. And, and the other thing I'll say is our paper dealt with just the growth attenuation issue. We felt that the literature had addressed the hysterectomy issue adequately. We had nothing to add to that. And our feeling was the breast bud issue was unique enough to Ashley that it wasn't the sort of thing that we were ready to write a paper and say this ought to be done on all kinds of girls. Um, and so we focused exclusively on the growth attenuation issue because we thought that was the piece of what had 
occurred that might have some generalizability and some importance. Um, but the criterion we set up was that these have to be kids who have very, very profound developmental delay. The prognosis has to be near certain, and it, and it has to be permanent. I mean, there, there can't be any sort of hope that they will not, that, that they will ever achieve um, capacity to make these sorts of decisions. We felt they should be non-ambulatory. Now, you know, we, I, I'm not sure Dan agreed with me, but I insisted this go in there. And the, the argument for non-ambulatory is this. Um, height has value to people who are walking around, having jobs, and doing that sort of thing. I mean, if you look at the sociologic importance of height, um, it is true you're likely to make a little bit more money. You're, li you're more likely to be the president of the college as opposed to um, an assistant professor. Um, when you walk into a room and people can see you're tall, they will just assume that you're a full professor and not an instructor. Um, and um, if I introduce myself the way I was introduced today, you all think I'm five foot ten, whereas in reality I'm not. Um, and it's because I was introduced, you know, as a full professor and all these other things. And, and if you ask students in a classroom how tall they think the instructor is or the lecturer is or the assistant professor, associate professor, or professor, you get a linear gradient in the height estimates based on how they're introduced stature-wise. Um, so height does carry status. Um, now, our feeling was, if you're dealing with somebody who's profoundly developmentally delayed, you're not talking about benefits in terms of being the president of the U.S. or having a job. And if you're non-ambulatory, then for the most part, people can't even tell how tall you are. And so even a developmentally delayed child who maybe has very limited capacities in other realms, if they're capable of walking around and interacting with other people, um, there's probably some value in being close to height, the same height as those other people. And so we felt that that, or at least I felt that that should be an exclusionary criterion. We felt there should be agreement on multiple evaluations by different providers. Um, obviously, there needs to be a willing provider, an endocrinologist slash surgeon um, to do these things. And we also recommended that they, they come for ethics committee review. Again, just to make sure that you know, all the issues have been thought about by a broad range of people. Um, and then the last thing we recommended is the one that has not come to pass, and I'll talk about why, and that is we felt really strongly that if this was the sort of thing that would be done to other kids beyond Ashley, there ought to be some formal mechanism for reviewing outcomes. Um, because although we have that literature from the 60s and 70s, it's not the greatest literature in the world, it's, and, and it's, it doesn't involve developmentally delayed kids who may have um, a different sort of array uh, or side effect profile and so on. Um, and, and the other thing that that would allow you to do is, is you know, if you do a really good outcome review that, that extends for decades, uh, you can make sure that this isn't being done on kids who later grow up and actually would like to or be capable of raising a child, which would be the worst possible outcome. So those are my principles, and if you don't like them, I do have others. Um, now, um, I love this quote by the CEO of Visa. Um, Everything has both intended and unintended consequences. The intended consequences may or may not happen. The unintended consequences always do. Um, so, um, you know, we the title had a boring you know, the paper had a boring title. We didn't think anybody would notice it. I, nonetheless, I was a little nervous, so I called our PR department a week before the publication date, and I said, you should just know this is coming out. I don't think anybody's going to see it. I don't think anybody's going to care. Um, but I want you to know about it so that, you know, if somebody cares, you're ready. And it's a good thing I made that call um, <laughs> because the aftermath was a bit of a zoo. So um, Ashley's treatment actually occurred in 2004. The archives article came out in October of 2006. And um, there was a fairly significant flurry of media attention after the original article, um, with probably the best piece um, appearing in the Ben Bulletin, which was actually a really nice story. It was well balanced. They had interviewed another mother of a, a, a child with developmental disabilities um, down in, in Oregon. Um, but it was the Ben Bulletin, let's face it. I mean, five people maybe read it. And, and so <laughs> despite the fact that it was probably the best article written uh, of, of the whole, whole bunch, um, <clears throat> it was in the Ben Bulletin. Um, and so nobody noticed it. And, and then it died down more or less. I mean, the, there were some disability rights organizations that continued to make a fair amount of noise, and the blog 
sites were fairly active, but the press, uh, it, was, the, it was over for the press because um, the story had been told. And, and, but, but in the interim, the press um, was not very happy with us because uh, what they really wanted was the family. And we had sat down several times with the family and said, you don't want to go there. Um, you don't want people knowing who you are. It's going to disrupt your family. You've got other young kids. This is just not, you know, there's no reason to do that. Um, let this remain fairly theoretical. And they agreed with that assessment. Uh, their, their initial response was, the only way we'll do a media interview is if Oprah calls. <laughs> um, well, there was a day where Oprah called. <laughs> and at that point, we went back to the family and we said, Oprah called. Um, and we still recommend you not talk to Oprah. And they said, that's probably a good idea. Um, so Oprah didn't get to do the piece. Um, but what the family did do, they, they didn't like the initial media coverage. And, and that initial flurry of media coverage was pretty unfair to the family. I mean, it, it painted this as a selfish decision and you know, all done to make their lives easier and so on. And it, it was fairly unfair. And so dad felt he needed to tell their story. So what he did was he wrote an extensive um, blog, blog about what they had gone through and why they had made the decisions they did. And they, he, had, he put some pictures of Ashley on there. Um, and then he, um, on New Year's Day um, of 2007, he emailed a reporter at the LA Times because that was the guy who was the most persistent, who kept uh, making contact with him and saying, I'd really like to do your story. Um, and he said, I'm still not doing my story, I'm not doing media interviews, but I just want you to know that I just went live with the blog and nobody knows about it except you. So if you want to do your story based on what's there, you can use the pictures, you can use the material, and you'll have a scoop. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and that is actually when the media onslaught occurred. That's when it went viral, it went national, it went international. That's when Time Magazine got interested, People Magazine, and everybody else. Um, for almost two weeks, we did almost nonstop interviews. Um, and uh, we had to make a conscious decision about that. Um, I, I, our PR department initially came to me and said, we're not quite sure how to handle this. There's, a part, there's part of our administration that thinks we ought to just refuse to do any interviews. Um, and I said, I said, you know, if, you refuse, if we refuse to do interviews, then we're essentially saying no comment. And when you say no comment, it makes it sound like you can't defend what you did. And I said, we had good reasons for doing this. We still believe that we did the right thing for this little girl, so let us tell our story. And that's what we did for two weeks. And um, what we saw was that public opinion shifted um, the more we told the story and why the parents did what they did and had, had the reasons they had. Um, that did not keep some individuals from protesting. It didn't keep... Um, uh, uh, disability rights groups, at least some of them, for um, condemning what we had done and so on. Um, but it got fairly broad coverage. Um, it, it gave me, it, there was one day in my life I heard, <clears throat> it was the same day I heard two things I never thought I'd hear ever. The first was Oprah called and the second was um, <laughs> they're ready for your People magazine photo shoot. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so as I said, there, there were lots of people who had different opinions here, and, and there was a lot of coverage that was really irresponsible. Um, uh, there was one very prominent bioethicist, for example, that, that sort of um, labeled this the Peter Pan syndrome, um, uh, which is silly because Peter Pan doesn't get older. Ashley gets older. So it's a bad analogy for an ethicist to be using. Uh, but he also referred to her as being frozen in time. Um, and. Um, so I started getting emails from people asking me when we were going to thaw out Ashley. I'm totally serious about this. There were people that thought we had actually frozen her, um, which, you know, kind of is beyond belief, but it, I actually got more than one email from somebody asking about that. Um, there were people that thought we had done surgery to shorten her, like cut off parts of her bones. And I mean, the, the misinformation was absolutely phenomenal. And, and a lot of people's judgments were being driven by this sort of misinformation. Um, there was outrage by some of the disability rights advocates who started um, uh, uh, picketing in front of the AMA uh, because the, it was an AMA journal that published the paper um, and ultimately investigated our hospital. Um, our hospital was investigated by the state agency. Um, 
unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, um, a court order had not been obtained for the hysterectomy. Um, the main reason for that was the family hired a lawyer to do that. It was a disability rights lawyer who had a disabled child himself, and he reviewed Washington State case law and wrote them a three-page letter that basically stated they did not need a court opinion because the case did not apply to cases like Ashley's. Um, so rather than getting a court order, he wrote them an opinion that said, you don't need to do this. It's unnecessary. And that's what they presented to the surgeon and the medical director when they showed up for surgery. And uh, the mistake that the hospital made was not having that letter reviewed by hospital counsel. Um, and, uh, you know, instead it was reviewed by two well-meaning uh, physicians who didn't really know exactly what this meant, but it looked pretty good and proceeded. Um, but it was because of that that the hospital ended up having to negotiate an agreement because they had essentially um, at least done, <clears throat> the reality is they had two choices. They could negotiate an agreement or they could adjudicate it with the courts. And my guess is the courts may very well have sided with the hospital, but hospitals don't like that kind of publicity. You know, hospital being sued by disability rights organization, right? I mean, it's just not what hospitals want. So the hospital negotiated an agreement that um, basically said we would obtain a court order in the future for not only hysterectomies but growth attenuation treatment um, and that we would put uh, an individual with a disability on our ethics committee, all of which was done. Um, that, had, that, that series of events had a chilling effect on other physicians and institutions. Um, we have not done another case since Ashley in large part because our endocrinologists won't go um, anywhere near it because they watched one of their own go through this and don't want to have the same thing happen to them. Um, the chilling effect has had one very important result. <laughs> it has not necessarily stopped the growth attenuation from occurring, but what it has absolutely guaranteed is that we can't study it. So when Dan Gunther and I wrote our paper, one of the most important things we recommended was that there be review of outcomes. That has now become impossible because nobody will talk about what they're doing and nobody will write about it and there's no way to find out how extensively this is being done, whether it's going well. Um, there's an informal network of some families that have gotten it done in various places, but that isn't data. So unfortunately, we created an, a, a big problem for ourselves in that sense. Um, now, there were um, a number of objections cited. I'm going to just go through five of them briefly. Um, the reality is what I started doing when all of this started happening is I, I read almost everything written about the Ashley case on the blogs and on the line and in the newspapers and in scholarly, there were about 20 scholarly articles written about the case. And I cataloged every ethical objection and there were like 30 of them. And then I responded to each of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through some of the more common ones. The first of which was that what we did to her was not natural and I guess my general response to that is, well, neither is medicine. And so we may as well get rid of everything we do if that's the case. Vaccinations aren't natural. Um, dialysis is not natural. And good grief, taking a kidney from one person and putting it in another person in a transplantation procedure is way not natural. So, <laughs> you know, and if you just look at Ashley's, um, gr the group of kids like Ashley, we're putting in G-tubes, we're putting in trachs, I mean, none of that is natural. So, you know, this is not really an objection um, that carries much, um, much water, the fact that it's not natural. Um, we also got accused of playing God. And again, I would say we're playing God every time we do something medically. I mean, I work in an ER and I play God all the time in the sense that I intervene with the natural trajectory of people's illnesses, hopefully saving their lives or helping them avoid disability or feel a little better. Um, but the fact of the matter is we do play God when we do that. And, and probably more importantly it's, it, it is to recognize <laughs> that when we sit in a room as an ethics committee and decide that Ashley's parents can do that, there may be a sense in which we're playing God. But if we sit in the same room and tell Ashley's parents they can't do that, we're also playing God. So this argument, again, really care. You play God no matter what decision you make here. You're making a decision that affects somebody else's life. Um, I would, you know, if you want to put that in theological terms, I would describe that as stewardship, um, not playing God. There, you know, playing God is when you're arrogant enough to think you're God, and I don't think anybody did in this case. The slippery slope argument was a very popular one. You know, there were a number of people who said, well, it's probably okay to do this for Ashley because of all her 
you know, individual needs and so on. But you know, there's a big slippery slope here, and the next thing you know, you're going to be doing it to somebody who has a mild disability, and and it shouldn't be done on. And and you know what I would say about slippery slopes is, um, it's a warning. You got to be careful. And I'm very familiar with slippery slopes. I showed you two pictures of Mount Baker. I've been on top of that mountain twice, and it's not particularly easy or safe to get to the top. But I decided to climb it, and you decide to climb it for two reasons. You know you're on a slippery slope, and you know you could slip and fall, and there could be a big problem. That's what the slippery slope's all about. But there's two important points to make. The first is, if you're just on the slippery slope and you got no good reason to be there, that's kind of dumb. But the reason, <laughs> the reason you're on the slippery slope is there's some benefit there. In other words, you've made a judgment that, you know, climbing this thing and getting to the top is actually worth the risk I'm taking. And that's what you're doing in cases like Ashley's case. The, probably the more important thing is you don't just climb the slippery slope. You put protection in place. So when I'm climbing Mount Baker, I've got an ice axe. I know how to use it. I'm with a team of guys I trust or women I trust. We're roped together. We've got crampons on our feet. We've scoped out the conditions ahead of time. We checked in with the park service to see what the route's like. We've done a lot of things to keep from sliding down the slippery slope and getting into trouble. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but it makes it a whole lot less, less likely to happen when you use care. And that's what the slippery slope does. Um, and, and so, you know, the precau precautionary principle is, is, is sort of a principle that some people use to argue against this which is a form of the slippery slope argument, and that is to say, when there are risks involved with doing this kind of thing, you just shouldn't do it. Um, and again, the problem with the precautionary principle is um, that it really doesn't um, allow you to gain any benefits that might come from doing something that carries some risks. Objection four was that this benefited the parents, not the child, and um, I just think that's wrong. I think with parents of developmentally disabled kids, will tell you that it's impossible to unwind their interests from their child's interests. Parents in general will tell you that. I mean, they're so intertwined that, you know, oftentimes what benefits your child benefits you as well. And that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't benefit your child. Um, and it, so it's unfair to sort of characterize these decisions this way. And then finally, there was an argument that this somehow violated her dignity. And that, that to me, represents an assertion without any content. Nobody ever described to me why it violated her dignity or what was undignified about what we were doing um, or what the meaning of dignity is, what they mean by that. It was just simply the assertion that it violated her dignity, and I never quite understood what that's supposed to mean if you don't describe it. Um, and why this was undignified for Ashley, it's unclear to me. Her, her parents actually requested all three things precisely because they valued her dignity. They did this because they thought it would benefit their daughter. Um, and it seems to me that that's valuing her as a person and sh um, investing her with dignity. So these are basically tragic choices. Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to this issue. I think in retrospect, what we did for Ashley was probably in her benefit. Her parents will tell you that it clearly was. Um, but these are situations without a clearly good choice. This is what we describe as tragic choices. Um, there's no perfect choice here. You have to sort of muddle through. You have to do what you think is the best, and you do so with courage and humility, and that's about the most that you can ask of people in these difficult situations. As Stanley Hauervas says, the demands of living morally are hard. We do not wish to face the truth that we live in the world where honesty and faithfulness don't always lead to good results and consequences, but sometimes to tragic choices. Have there been other cases? There have. Um, for the most part, we don't know how many. Um, we don't know uh, in many cases where they have occurred, but we do know, and I hear from parents periodically, that they've had this done at one place or another. Um, and I think that's unfortunate that we have lost the ability to track outcomes because that's we, we had the opportunity to learn about this um, as we move forward, and now it's happening in secrecy, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, Ashley is now, this is an old slide, she's now 16 years old. Her parents continue to be very, very happy about the results. Um, Ashley is continuing to thrive, but also has um, uh, you know, not progressed from a cognitive perspective. She's um, stopped growing at four foot five. Um, she's about 65 pounds now. 
um, in weight, her dad can still lift her uh, without the use of uh, mechanical devices. And, and as I said, they're quite happy about that. Um, I would point out 4.5 is not freakishly small, uh, particularly for somebody who's in a wheelchair. And you know, one of the, the one of the other things that sort of we got accused of was that we were taking this, you know, her and turning her into some kind of a circus act, some kind of a freak. And and uh, it's we're not talking about her being 18 inches tall. I mean, she's she's a short woman, and um, if you don't take her clothes off, you don't know she's had a breast bud. Uh, removal, and you don't know that she's missing a uterus, and there's nothing, you met her on the street, you would have no idea that she had undergone any of these procedures. Um, and so that's Ashley. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we have a little time for questions and so on, if uh, people have them. Yes. So, so I guess there's a lot of talk about the story that Ashley Kelly made about mm -hmm. being a super sensitive person who was kind of afraid. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I mean, it's like I feel like it's a kind of good lesson that she did because yeah. you guys were able to really um, uh, prevent the, the growth that she otherwise would have had had she gone along a conventional diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's not to say that people should be able to go home with their breasts intact. That's mm -hmm. just too big of a thing. But yeah. That whole scene is kind of, I don't know if that element of the story is necessarily talked about. The, the, the other kind of medical question I have is, did anybody take down what they thought was the safety of the procedure away? I mean, I don't know that it's necessary. So the, um, so the issue is, the, the question with regard to Ashley is about the precocious puberty issue. and. Um, you know, I don't know if the endocrinologist sought a cause for that. I, what I hear from um, people who take care of kids like Ashley is this is actually a pretty common problem that they frequently do go into. Um, they do experience precocious puberty, um, and um, and so I'm I'm not sure. You you may be able to help here. I I don't know if the, if you work it up in in kids like Ashley or you yeah. just. And you know, as far as Ashley goes, that, that was actually one aspect of her situation that was not discussed extensively by the committee that she was in the experiencing precocious puberty. Which, you know, for us that presented a timing issue. You know, you either have to do it now or you've lost your opportunity. Um, after the fact, we discussed it a great deal because after the fact, I found myself um, spending a lot of time with endocrinologists that I hadn't before. Um, and, um, and this came up very frequently in conversations, and, and there were two aspects of those conversations. The, the first of which is that when you've got a young girl like Ashley who's already experiencing precocious puberty, that almost certainly is going to attenuate their growth all by itself. So you can get a few more inches with high-dose estrogen, but you've already got somebody who's going to be considerably shorter than their genetic potential if you don't interfere with it. Um, and that's the second aspect that um, that sort of I learned in these discussions is that there were many endocrinologists who, um, who had actually been, you know, seeing patients with precocious puberty who also had profound developmental dis um, disability, and having this discussion with parents, you know, we can, we can stop the precocious puberty, but you need to ask yourself whether you really want to do that, and what your reasons are, because here's what will happen if you do, and here's what will happen if you don't. And um, you know, for some parents, they didn't want their child to develop secondary sex characteristics early, and so they're willing to take the extra height to avoid that. But for other parents, they're willing to make the trade if their child ends up a little smaller. So it gets, it's an interesting added element. Yes. Um, 
Yeah. Do you ever regret the fact that you published it because it caused the same passions that you desired to learn and have passion for to come to light? Um, uh, no. I mean, I I have somewhat mixed feelings. I I guess I feel um, my overall belief is that um, we shouldn't not be talking about things just because some people don't want us talking about them, um, and. And so I think it's important that people write this kind of article. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who say, you were really brave to do that. And I don't, I don't think that was the case. I, I'm, I'm probably more stubborn than brave. I just think if there's an issue that needs to be discussed, somebody should write about it. And if nobody else is going to, then I'm going to. Um, and yet my biggest regret, though, I, I think there was a lost opportunity here. Um, because this was a phenomenal opportunity for the disability rights organizations to use this case and say, you know, we can make this unnecessary for a lot of families if we just can convince legislators to give sufficient funding to these families that they can actually modify their homes and bring in lifts for the families that want to do that. And that's what I thought would happen, and I was profoundly disappointed that the disability rights community went on the attack and lost that what I thought was a wonderful opportunity to actually benefit many of these families. And, and many of these families actually felt as if the dis disability rights community didn't understand their needs and turned their back on them, uh, which was unfortunate. I mean, I, I think it was a lost opportunity. And that probably was my biggest disappointment, because I, I, there was a real opportunity here um, by not going as negative as many of them went, and, and it got lost. Yeah, yeah. Where did that, and, and that seems to me like a real spot for the rhetoric that could yeah. be used as something that will start and carry it. And yeah. Really, yeah. Where did that phrase come so from? So the pillow angel, that is um, mom and dad called Ashley their pillow angel. And, you know, and, and I know a lot of people found that kind of creepy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, parents have pet names for their kids. And... <laughs> Um, some of them are pretty creepy <laughs> and <laughs> to other people. Um, so, you know, when I heard the pillow angel, I mean, I didn't really have a response. I, my response was, well, if that's what they want to call her, that's fine. And, you know, I think there was more sympathy from other families who had kids like Ashley because they understood what that term meant, which is, you know, we have a kid who we really value. That's the angel part. And um, about all she's capable of doing is lying on pillows. And she's lying on pillows because we don't want her to get decubitus ulcers. So, I mean, it's actually rooted in their life experience. And, and, oh, and totally. And, 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 and that was a big problem. So the, the Pillow Angel title came out from Dad's blog. I mean, it's pillowangel.org. And so that's the blog site. If you Google pillowangel.org, you'll get their blog site. And, and they call her their pillow angel. I mean, they call her Ashley when they talk to people. But that's their sort of pet name for her. And um, you know, I, my feeling is, you know, if that's what they want to call her, let them call her that. I mean, it's, it's a, for them, it's a term of value, and it means something. And it's not for me to judge whether that meaning is um, you know, it, it, in reality, the way they use it, it's not creepy, uh, even though a lot of people interpret it that way. I was a little distressed that, you know, you don't have anything better to talk about than what the family calls their kid. I mean, because there was a lot of, so a lot of really negative stuff surrounding that term. People just started attacking the family for what they called their daughter, and it was just, come on. Back there, right in the middle. Yes. So it's a, it's a good question for somebody who's not in medicine. Um, I see a lot of the doctors in the audience going. Um, <laughs> that's been routine practice for decades. Um, it, the appendix, as far as we know, has no known function. And um, it can cause problems. And so for 
literally decades, I mean, as long as I've been in medicine, the practice has been, if you're going into the abdomen anyway, for any reason, take the appendix while you're there. Uh, that way, there's two reasons for that. The first is, once it's gone, this patient can't get appendicitis, so they won't require a second surgery. The second is, um, when this patient comes in with abdominal pain, um, which may be because they've had abdominal surgery, um, we at least don't have to put that on the differential diagnosis. Um, so it's, it, it makes our evaluation easier. And I can tell you as an ER doc, I really appreciate those kids who come in without an appendix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> makes my job so much easier. Um, so, but that's why they did it. It was nothing specific to Ashley. It was just you had a general surgeon going into her abdomen for another reason, and that's just what they did. And they get the parent's permission to do that or the patient's permission. Um, but that's really routine.